Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For it is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pasture. Beloved congregation, our help is in the name of Jehovah God, who has made heaven and earth and redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. Receive his blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship in song number 323. Father, again, in J Jesus' name we meet. Let's sing these four stanzas, 323. Read this morning from the law of God, Deuteronomy chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Lord addresses the congregation of Israel. And he says to them that he is the Lord. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. The same God addresses us. This covenant God addresses us who have been brought out from sin and constituted as his people and so the word of God comes to us in the light of our redemption through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, sprinkled not on doorposts, but on the cross of Calvary, and now applied to our own hearts and lives through the Holy Spirit, who is the agent of the application of the salvation of God. In great anticipation, hear now what the Lord, our Redeemer, would say to us, his people. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy 
unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember, if thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm, therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself showed us the, the fulfillment and the summary of the law of God, pointing us to the heart of the matter, of our responsibility before God Almighty and before the neighbor. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and also that this is the first and the great commandment, the principal thing in all of life, that we love God with all that is in us. And secondly, the second commandment is like unto it, flowing from the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments, these principal commandments of heaven to our earth and to our hearts, all the law and the prophet do rely. And so we receive the law of God in the light of God's covenant mercies and admonitions and promises to those who trust in him and who would walk in his way with fear and with trembling and with joy. And so now, covenant people, let's sing number two in the Psalter hymnal, a versification of Psalm 1 about the blessed man, woman, or child. And the blessed man, woman, or child is the true Israelite indeed, Old Testament and New Testament, loved of God, who loves to love the law of God and keeping the commandments of God that he might praise him. So blessed is he who loves God's precepts. Let's sing the five stanzas, number two.
We have heard the Lord speak already in our service, the Lord who has drawn us to come and worship Him, has pronounced blessing upon us, called us to worship, reminding us of the great joy that we have as the covenanted people of God. In this great assembly, then, we, we give great praise to God. And this is our calling, our delight and privilege. We are aware, however, of our sins that still remain and sins that bother us no end because they are these great things that interfere with our progress in the life of God. And there is this problem that we have that so confounds us that it's as if we're unbelieving. We can act like that, can't we? We can act like an unbelieving people of God, even in the church of Christ and on the way to church. We wrangle with one another and our thoughts are far from the God who loves us and who loves us to worship with Him, uh, worship Him with undivided attention. To such sinners, to such sinners, even backsliding ones, and even those who haven't tasted and seen at all the goodness of God, Isaiah the prophet calls us this way, Come now, let us reason together. And he's talking to Israel, who from the head to the toe has been pronounced filthy and dirty. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing... And obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And we have these threats for disobedience, for these promises for all of those in, in whom the Spirit is working to say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Help me to love you, to obey you, to draw near to you and to live for you. And that spirit of the ones in whom God's spirit is working. Let's now draw near to God in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you declare pardon. You do. To all sinners who hate their sin. And who see the scripture's light, the glorious light of the gospel, of the great exchange of Jesus' righteousness and our unrighteousness, of Jesus' purity and our impurity. So that through faith, his righteousness and purity are transferred to our account and our condition, our person. And all of our sins and iniquities and guilt and shame is transferred to His that He might wash it as He's made sin for us and is our complete Redeemer. Lord, we hear and we pray, Father, for the ears to hear better. This is what we're about in worship. And so, Father, as we repent of our sins and the ugliness of our condition, naturally, from the head to the toe, we are vile and filthy. As we repent of these things, being cognizant of it, deeply sensitive of it, now in your presence, as you've opened up your, your word to us, we pray, Lord, truly to know the gospel truth. Truly to have our minds enlightened so that we can reason that far greater is grace than the greatest of sinners. And Lord, then, we're going to trust in that word. We're going to trust in that wonderful, wonderful Savior. And, Father, 
as we've been led to do by your Spirit. And in all aspects of our worship, we're going to praise you and celebrate right now. And so, Father, we turn from dismal sins and the dismal swamp of our natural condition and of our own habits that are vile and, and habits of unbelief. To thee, our God, we worship and praise thee, Lord. We worship and praise. We celebrate, we sing. Something, some great and new thing has happened to this earth. In the fullness of the time, and time was all about the empty works of man. Jesus has come, whom you have sent. The name is given above every other name whereby we must be saved. That name from heaven, which to appropriate and make it our, our Savior name, our, our wonderful, matchless name and friend, is to have life. And he's come, and time now has this significance. And it's seen as all the while as having significance. It's all about the coming of your son. And he's come. And he's died for wretched sinners like we are. And even the, the religious ones who thought they had it all together. He's died for us who live under bridges or in great houses. He's died for us who have education or who have none, who have money, or who have none, and all in between, red, yellow, black, brown, and white, he's died for his own, chosen before the foundation of the world, bought by his blood. And now to them he comes in his spirit. And so, Lord, we are among those people now, and that's why we're here, and we have a song to sing. We have joy to express. We have words to pray, Lord. They're not ours. They're yours. You said, call us Father. Here we are, your children. Father, Father in heaven. You said to pray to hallow the name of God. Here we are, Lord. Hallowed be thy name. You've told us to pray for all our needs, and here we are, body and soul needy, saying, Lord, help us with bread and with life, with a position in life that we can serve you and sanctification that no matter what our position, we can be godly and holy. We pray for the great coming of your kingdom. But again, Father, it's all about celebration. It's all about reflecting upon what you have done, what you're doing, and that Jesus is on the throne and coming again. Once he came in humiliation, soon in great glory. Oh, we can hardly wait. Father, we celebrate. We celebrate what you do in our lives personally. You forgive our sins every day, even now. Even though we've come with the burdens of sin in a week of, of wrestling and losing, it seems, all the matches with the devil. We shouldn't even have been in the ring with him, but we, we entertained that. Yet you forgive. And you say, oh, come, sinner. Let's reason together about your redemption, about your belonging to Jesus, about the call to trust. And so we do, and we're glad. We celebrate the fullness of life, no matter what we have or don't, no matter if we're not like the next guy or the next lady in beauty or in strength or in agility, no matter that we're no Olympians, we're just ordinary sinful people. Well, yours makes all the difference. You celebrate, and we've been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, and, and that now there's been this great change in all creation. All creation is given to us, as the apostle says. It's given to us that we might serve you. It is for us, too, the good and the bad and the ugly. It's all for us because Christ is for us, and so rather than be opponents. Christ commands from heaven that every situation and trial, droughts and abundant rain, and everything in between, they're all for our good, and nothing shall separate us from your love. Oh, God, we celebrate you. And we pray that we may taste and see in this worship once again the reason for celebration in your great giving of your truth. 
We ask, Lord, your blessing upon our church. We thank you even as we pray for blessing for the great blessings you have given, evident in our bulletin as well and in our pew. You add to our number. You add families. You add individuals. You add those who have not been in our own church, some who have not been in any church, but they've been lost in the land of the dead. You add from our own loins, your people, and you give them to confess their faith. And so, whether young or old, here we are, Father, recipients of the great heritage of truth, of the promises of God to us and our children, even to as many as our God shall call, of the blessing that Jesus pronounced upon the children of the covenant seed, of the blessing of home, so that we can worship together and now church home. We see it before our very eyes. As we grow this way, Father, we pray to give you all the more thanks and to behold the diversity in the body as well as the unity we have, to behold and appreciate the different perspectives, the different talents, the different abilities, to behold and to pray with regard to the different needs and different situations of life. Here we are with blessed opportunities further to witness of your truth that you gather your way, your time, your people, as many as you would save and build up. And now here at Sovereign Grace, you've added to the, the good ship Sovereign Grace, and here we are, all on deck, Father, all hands on deck. Yes, we're responsible members. We each have a, a job to do, something that is significant in the life of the congregation. We pray that the new members and all of us may, may find this job, this work, and know that we are all participants and all vital agents of the truth and the promulgation of the truth of Christ. We thank you for all the visitors we have from week to week, many of them. We pray that you would stir in their hearts to draw closer to us and we to them, that we can worship you and be committed together to, to Christ and his church, his body, his bride. We can together be this people that stands strong on the gospel traditions, the apostolic things you have given of the glories of the gospel. Lord, even as we celebrate all the mercies, all the blessings that we have been given, and that your church worldwide has been given, we pray for the people of God in their need. We live in a terrible time. We live in a time of tumult and unrest and and we can, we can see it in the politics and the politicians. We can see it in, in unbelievers running for office and, and cultists and, and those who are so off-center in even the policies of our own land to which we've all agreed are, are good ones. And yet, Father, you are the God who is, is pleased to, to bring about even these things in our nation all the tumult, all the unrest, all the disunity, somehow you're working your plan. And Lord, we pray that there may be, there may be this revitalization among your people in this land so that there can be, Father, even if it be your will, among the politicians and among the government, in the government, this recognition of the righteousness even of God of the law of God. And we pray, Father, that this may be so that there's some truth shown even in the high places of what is right. And there's denunciation once again of immorality where now there's celebration of the greatest of immorality. Lord, we pray as we speak in mourning for all the dead which are killed and slain, even in our land, all the abortions, that there would be, Father, this return to the sense of justice and honor and of the sanctity of life. Oh, what a miserable condition in which we are as a nation. Lord God, may the church lead the way and denounce these things that people call liberties and denounce these things in the light of the word of God, which people call their own choices. Lord God in heaven, help there to be among your people 
this leading of the way in righteousness and holiness, this offering of alternatives to death, even the life of the gospel, this presenting to the neighbor the way of peace, which is only in the way of righteousness. But Lord, may it be the true righteousness, the true life. It's not even, first of all, about bodies and laws and so on. It's all about your kingdom. So in this nation, may the kingdom within, the kingdom of heaven within lead the way. And Lord, if you're, if you're so pleased that there be this decadence, even in your sovereign will, somehow, if it's your purpose, even to, to sort through the nations this way, Lord, we should know you're on the throne, and you are. You're on the throne as well, Lord, when you send the drought. Miserable it is, we pray for rain, for you give us to pray for what we need, the daily bread. Lord, rain is so vital. We pray for it, Lord. We pray for the storms that are so necessary, the rain and the survival of the trees and the flowers and the crops so that we can live. Father in heaven, give us to see, even in this, in the parched land, the dying trees and, and the crops that will not have any yield. We pray to see your hand, to see your sovereignty, your goodness, your holiness, and your moving us to repent of sin and to cling to Jesus. God in heaven, we pray, bless, and bless us in all our personal needs, our needs of surgery sometimes. We pray for our sister Abby that you would bless her in her surgery, bless her so that there can be a resolution too of the pain in her body. And Lord, may it be that she looks to you. And if you heal, Lord, may she give the praise to you. And if there'd be this, this further testing and trial, even through pain, may she look to you and her family too. Bless them all together. And us too as Church of Christ, we thank you, Lord, that we could bear one another's burdens. And Lord, there's so many burdens. There's so many trials we all have. The new families, the families that are here, the visitors, we all have burdens, family problems and difficulties and separations. We've had difficulties that have marred our life and all these things, economic woes and difficulties. We can hardly find work. Our bodies don't work as they, they ought to or as they used to. God bless us. Help us all to see the sufficiency of grace, day by day grace. And now, Lord, we would continue our worship, but may it be as we end the congregational prayer that it's a prayerful worship. We want to hear in, in prayerfulness and preach in prayerfulness the truth of your word. Be with us. Be with us as we give. We've been given unto, Father. Help us to reflect that in our giving to the cause of Christ. Hear our prayers, O great God. We celebrate, we have needs, but we're going to carry on, Father, because the celebration is praise to you, and the worthiness of your name is that which we know and delight in. For Jesus' sake, amen. We worship the Lord now in the giving of our offering for the cause of Jesus Christ here, the proclamation of the truth, the witness of this congregation to the truth as it is in Jesus.
Let's turn now to versification of Psalm 78, 150 in the Psalter hymnal. It's a calling to Israel to pass on the truth. We receive a calling like that today, and we're told to stand fast in the, in the apostolic traditions as we hear from the Word of God. But Psalm 78 is this rehearsal of the history of God's providence and care of His people Israel, and this rehearsal of this history was to be taught to the children that they might never forget. Two stanzas, 150. Take our Bibles at this time and turn to the second epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. Hear now the word of the Lord, the New Testament revelation to us to the Apostle Paul, inspired by God to write to Thessalonians and also to the church of all ages. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or preventeth will let or prevent until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Thus far we read the word of God, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. That word here which, to which I would draw your attention in the preaching of the gospel is verse 15 of Second Thessalonians 2 where we read, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. We have been considering the vital, extremely important subject of the Word of God, namely the revelation of God, the unveiling of God himself and his truth in all the world and especially to his people. This is vital and most important for a congregation that would say it is a congregation that believes in the sacred scriptures so that we can be founded four square on the revelation of God. We have considered in this connection the truth of the scriptures themselves, which attest to the fact that they are inspired they are God-breathed words and sentences and passages and books. Indeed, the whole book of the Old and New Testament is the divine word of God given through men to us men and for our great prophet. We are to believe that word. We are to receive this completely and with confidence as the very word of God and to live accordingly. We have considered, secondly, God's revelation, his general revelation in nature. We are to look at that word, and we are to hear what the heavens declare of the glory of God. We are to see that this nature, though not sufficient to save, is nevertheless a complementary light to the greater light of the scriptures that help us in our pilgrimage to give glory to God with the stars. We've considered as well the, the revelation in Psalm 119, for example, of God in the Torah, that which is not only the law of the Old Testament, but which is everything about the revelation of God. In this unique way, God speaks to us through the Torah so that we delight in it, as the psalmist did of old, took delight in this revelation and knew in it and through it even Jesus Christ the Lord. Now we consider another aspect of the revelation of God and of the uh, attentiveness to it that the people of God are called to, we consider the traditions. Paul here speaks to us in this words, this exhortation, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. There's an incentive that the apostle gives and an incentive to which I would draw your attention even as we are beginning to expound this word of God about these traditions. The incentive is found in the context of the text, and this, this incentive is vital for our appreciation of these traditions. Incentive is in the word, first of all, therefore. Note that word. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. The apostle's referring to something to which he's alluded. That something is a someone. He's called the Antichrist. The Antichrist is revealed here front and center in 2 Thessalonians 2 in all of his dastardly ways as an agent of the devil himself who would undermine even, if it were possible, the confession of the children of God. He comes with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, the Bible says. He comes masked as Christ and God themselves. He comes as a dupe. He comes as an ape, an imitator of the Savior himself. And he shall deceive many. In light of that, the apostle is saying, therefore, stand fast. The days of Antichrist are upon us. The agents of the devil are among us. And in the churches, they are wreaking havoc. And many are being deceived by this mystery of iniquity, the 
man of sin and of lawlessness. So that's an incentive to us today to stand fast and hold the traditions. But secondly, there's a positive. And the positive is what God has done to us. Note the immediate context, verses 13 and 14. We are bound, Paul says, and his helper. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, you so blessed, so called, so chosen, so bound for glory, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Brethren, we hear now the word of God. Stand fast in the apostolic traditions. First of all, we consider those traditions. Secondly, what it is to stand by them and to hold those traditions. And finally, the incentives that the word of God gives for us to stand fast. Traditions which Thessalonians had been taught by word, orally, oral traditions, or by epistles, actually singular here, epistle, may refer to the first book of Thessalonians. These are truth. That we must say, first of all. The apostle is speaking of truth traditions, whether they're orally transmitted, communicated, or written down. And the proof of that, beloved, that God is speaking here to us of nothing different than truth traditions is found in the immediate context where the truth is presented to the people of God as something that many are not receiving, but which we should hold on to. Verse 10. Satan comes, and the Antichrist, who is after the working of Satan, verse 9, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasures in unrighteousness. Therefore, it seems to be clear to, to me, and I hope it does to you, beloved, that the traditions the apostle is saying that the believers ought to hold are truth, are truth traditions, orally communicated, written down the truth. Well, what is the truth? We know what the truth is. We know the Bible. The truth is the truth as it is in Jesus. There is no truth except as it is in Jesus. Understand that. The truth is in Jesus Christ. There's no truth of creation without Jesus. There's no truth of heaven without Jesus. There's no truth of sanctification, godliness, church, or, or anything without the truth as it is revealed in Jesus. Oh, how important this is for us leaders in families and leaders in churches and witnesses in the world to speak of that. Truth is in Jesus. It's not just truth of God generally. It's God revealed in Jesus and so, the gospel of salvation is what the truth is all about. For Jesus is God with us. Do you know this Jesus? Do you? I ask you. If you know this Jesus, you know that God is with us and that he comes and that he dies for sin and that he's risen to the right hand of God. The historical Jesus is the God of eternity saving us in time who are creatures of time. The gospel is God now through his mediatorial son sending forth his spirit to apply what he's done there and then on Calvary to us here and now in this time, in this place, in this situation of our own sin and misery. So the spirit of Jesus Christ is involved in this gospel message and so to the glory of God we live now. There's this wonderful truth of sanctification that's also brought out here. And so, especially though, we ought to remember that the truth of the gospel, 
the good news and the calling to a certain moral behavior, that is, to the glory of God, were called uh, by the gospel to the obtaining of glory and through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, verse 13 and 14. This is especially about the end times. Paul has been speaking of the truth of the end times, and the first and Thess second Thessalonian epistles are all about this focus on the end. People had questions. What's going to happen? What's happened to our, our family that's died already? And what's going to come? What are the signs of the end? It's all here in, in Thessalonians and how we ought to behave. And certainly if it was then about end times, it is now that we should be hearing about the end times because many of these things the apostle has spoken of are even before our very eyes being coming to pass. It is the end. It is very close to the end. We don't know. We don't set dates. But in light of the end, we ought to consider the truth of the end, lest we be deluded. And so the truth is the gospel and the gospel of the end times and that moral component, which there always is, the call to live godly and to live in light of the end and of the gospel. But now, the striking thing about this truth is that it's called traditions. Striking because I think a lot of us have a bad taste in our mouth when we speak of traditions or hear someone trying to promote traditions. But here you have the apostle promoting traditions. It's not, you see, the Pharisees here who are calling us to hold their traditions of men. Here, the apostle is saying, hold, stand fast and hold the traditions of apostles and of their helpers, traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. This is very important for us to, to see here. This text is speaking of apostolic traditions. Now, initially, these were communicated by word. And as Paul was speaking in the first century, there was an oral tradition. It was passed from church to church. I was telling my children in devotions this morning. The New Testament was not written right away. Only parts of it were available to people. The Thessalonians may have had only 1 Thessalonians at this time. But now they're getting 2 Thessalonians. They might not have had Matthew because Matthew was supposedly written after Thessalonians. But they had preachers, though, apostolic preachers and their helpers. And there is this to which the apostle is drawing the attention of the Thessalonians. There is this that have been received from the Lord and given to apostles. Paul says that over and over. I've received of the Lord this, but now I'm going to pass it on to you. And that's the idea of tradition. Tradition is simply a word that describes the truth, the apostolic truth, as something that's passed on. Not something that's invented, but something that's passed on. Like a baton in a race. You receive it from somebody who ran the race first, and then you pass the same baton on in the relay race until all four or however many are in the relay race have passed the one baton on and finished the race. Truth is like that. It's paradosis, given beside, given to pass down, received from one to pass on to another, to be held now, the apostle says, this thing that's passed on, to be held in order to pass it on once you have someone to pass it on to. But the important thing here is that these traditions are traditions apostolic. They began with the Lord himself. The Lord is the one who is the head of the tradition, as it were, the beginner of the tradition, the fulfillment of the word of God. He has passed on truth, communicated revelation directly to eyewitnesses, apostles, and their helpers. So it's we and Silas and so whoever else. This truth that's been given, this way, authenticated the authority and the witness of the apostles. 
It's vital for the apostle to remind these people, we haven't pulled this baton, pulled this truth out of our pocket. We are not those who shoot from the hip and come with our own opinions. This is traditional truth, something that has been given of the Lord and passed on to us. Now, this is so vital because what the apostle is saying is that now we pass it on to you. Note, the Thessalonians are the church. To the church is given the apostolic tradition. To believers are given the revelation themselves to hold, and by holding this, to stand fast in the truth. So, therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions. Now you hold the traditions which we passed on you. Don't drop the baton. Don't do that. Don't try to invent something else or pick something else up. Hold the traditions. Hold it dear. And that's the idea. Be strong in your standing fast by gripping the traditions, the truth as it is in Jesus, the truth of all time, the truth of the end times. Hold it fast. There's a great deposit that's been given to the church in our consideration of the, the doctrines of the Word of God, we've, we've seen that. It's like this Sovereign Grace Church is a ship, really part of the great ship church of all ages. And in the hold is the Word of God. It's the hold. You can even call it the rudder. But it's, it's the, the basic fundamental thing that the church has. And the Apostle Paul is saying, Hold that. And he's implying, you've been given that. It's been passed on to you. Now you hold that. And we could say that we're even being called here to, to hear the admonition of Jeremiah, who himself was saying to the people long ago in Jeremiah's way, hold the traditions when he said, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way. And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah holds the people to account for what they've received already. He says, don't go after the new paths. Walk in the old paths. Ask for them. Ask your leaders to show you those paths to help you along the way. This is the same idea as the New Testament saying, hold fast the word of God that we've given to you. Jude would call this word of God and these traditions, plural, the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith, Jude 3. Earnestly contend for the faith. It was known already then. The truths, the word of God, the apostolic truth. Well, beloved, we're called, this is my second point, stand fast. I just want to elaborate on that. It's called here in our text to be immovable, as strong as a rock in our unshaken conviction of the truth of the Word of God. We are stand, we're called here to stand so that we are standing on the rock or in the Lord. Other exhortations in the Bible call us to stand fast in the Lord, in the communion of the Lord. And the idea is that as we stand fast in the truth, we are standing in the communion of our Lord, whose truth it is, so vital. There's not a distinction and separation between truth and Jesus. The truth is the truth as it is in Jesus. And Jesus, the word of God, is revealed in the truth. And to hold the truth is to stand and to hold Jesus himself more even on that presently. But now the question is, how? How? And this is where we need especially to focus, and even for a large part of the center of this sermon here. How do we do this? The first thing that is vital for a church, sovereign grace church, any church, anyone listening here who's a believer, and anyone listening maybe on the radio or wherever this sermon goes, 
is called to understand that there are means that God gives for us to hold fast, the tra to stand fast and hold the traditions of the apostles. Number one, there are the means of grace that God has given for the public ministry of the truth. The church has been given means. There are two especially, the preaching and the sacraments for these uh, people to stand fast and hold the apostolic truths. There are means of preaching and sacraments precisely because preaching is said to work faith and the sacraments to confirm faith. Now, what's so important about faith? Faith is that by which we hold the traditions, grasp them, grip them tight. Faith is the bond that joins us to Jesus and his truth. It's the eyes to see. It's the love to love. It's the conviction that we are held and therefore we will hold. Faith is this marvelous gift. And God has given to us the means whereby faith is worked, preaching, and by which faith is confirmed the sacraments. And so we have these public means of grace. Use them. Attend the means of grace. Frequent the house of God. Hear the word of God. And believe. Then there's private means of grace that are apostolic traditions. I, should, I don't know if I have to point this out to you, but the public means of grace are apostolic traditions. They are revealed in the Word of God is what we should do. But there's also private means of grace, like reading the Word of God, as we've heard in the book of Revelation. Blessed are they that hear and that read and that do the Word of God. You read the Word of God, take it in, meditate upon it, not hear it as going fast and furious from one thing to another, but hear it as you would hearing your Savior and read it, taking time to read and to be holy and read it. Then there's prayer, of course. God has given us prayer. Prayer is that by which we exercise our faith, isn't it? We talk to God. We say, good Lord, help me to know you. And Lord, thanks for knowing me. And we say, help me to know the truth as it is in Jesus personally. So these means of grace, public and private, and, and there are more of these things, but these are the main things. But then there's this, and this is where there seems to be the rub among many, even who come to this text. There are ecclesiastical traditions. Ecclesiastical traditions. Now the apostle is speaking of apostolic traditions here. He's calling brethren to stand fast and hold the traditions which they'd been taught by his own word, his own epistle, or the words and epistles of other apostles. The church of Jesus Christ recognized that this word of the apostles was vital for her existence. The apostolic tradition was that on which they would be based forever and ever until the kingdom come. That is clear in the fact that after the oral traditions passed away, they could not be remembered so much, the church canonized the scripture. The traditions of the apostles now are canonized. They are forever held as the standard or norm in the truth of the word of God in all 66 books of the Bible, which have been approved by the church of Jesus Christ as God's word. They've been recognized to be God's word. And now we live by these doctrines here. We live by these exhortations here. The hope and comfort that is given in the word of God. At the same time, it is also true that God has given to the church also to develop her traditions. I call them ecclesiastical traditions, which are aids to us to receive the word of God and to grow in our understanding of it. I'm talking, for example, about creeds. We are a creedal church here. 
Most of Protestantism has creeds that they live by. Some say no creed but Christ, more on that presently. We believe that God has given traditional truth to the church also so that she might have a good and godly tradition or thing to pass on and to hold dearly so that she could hold the apostolic truth. Here's what I mean. In the very nature of church, people of God, we are receivers of truth. We also are, as church, a teaching church. That's the nature of church. God gave in Jesus Christ when he ascended apostles, some apostles, some prophets, but also pastors and teachers to the church to explain the word of God, to develop the doctrines of the word of God so that we and our children could have the church, the truth, and pass it on. So the ecclesiastical tradition of creed is not something in addition to and supplementing the word of God as if that wasn't important and vital and crucial, but it is an aid because God has made it so that we are this church that is a traditional church. We receive the truth and we would pass it on to the next generation. We would do that by developing in the truth itself. Creeds are just vital for this. They are not vital as the word of God is, but they are an extremely important instrument to keep us from error, to guide us into the truth, say, of the Trinity, to explain to us the, the truth of Genesis through Revelation as it bears upon the nature of God, the decrees of God, the grace of God. Creeds have been this vital instrument. And we ought to know that this is even what Jesus has promised. When he promised in John 16, verse 13, that he would send the Spirit who would teach you of himself and guide you into all the truth. What he's promised is, is that the church would develop in the truth and profit from the word of God and have these creeds to help us to know the word of God. So more on, on that presently, but there's all kinds of traditions then, all kinds of things that we hold dear that aren't the word of God, but they're based on the word of God to help us get into the word of God and help us not only in our mind, but in our worship. There's traditions, for example, of reading the law of God. They're not inspired. It's not required of us to read the law of God in worship every Sunday. That's not required. But it is something that we have, have received from our fathers as something that's a, an important aspect of worship. We need to be reminded of our sins and miseries and to flee to Jesus and to have this standard set before us every Lord's Day so that we can remember truth and remember the way of gratitude. And there's other things we do, and there's, there's songs we have, song books and so on. They're part of the deposit that God has given, not infallibly, but something that's an aid. And I find this here also not excluded by the fact that the brethren are to stand fast and hold the apostolic traditions. No, no. The complete truth of it all is that God has given ecclesiastical traditions as well to help us to guide us in the apostolic ones. But now, I just want to point out, of course, there's been a great controversy here. On the one hand, you have people, even whole denominations, that say, see, Paul says, hold the traditions you've been taught, whether by word or epistle, our epistle. That means tradition that we invent is also acceptable. We can have traditions because, well, Paul says we ought to obey them, which are not even apostolic. That's wrong. When a church even says that there can be traditions that are not based on the Word of God and not helping them to be in the Word of God, it has become a traditionalistic church, and it has taken away from the authority of the Word of God. But the traditions that we hold are the apostolic ones with the aid of creeds, but they may not substitute for the Bible. But on the other hand, it's just as wrong 
and say, no creed but Christ. Why? Because of the nature of truth. The nature of truth is that it is to be held by us and then passed on. It's the nature of the church to be a teaching church and to have no creed but Christ is really to say we have a creed. But we don't want to consider the church of the past and how God has been working in the church of the past and of all ages to help us to stand against heresy. I say to people who have no creed but Christ, you believe the Trinity? They say, sure. I say, why? Well, the Bible tells us so. And I say, no. You believe that because the church has led you to see that the Bible tells you so. We have creeds. The first creeds of the church hammered out the truth of the Trinity in the Bible. And creeds have been this vital aspect of our existence, and they shall be also of Sovereign Grace Church to tell us where the lie is, where the delusion is about the, the coming of Jesus Christ, for example. So we must hold the traditions which we've been taught, whether by word or epistle, and don't go to the extreme. Make our traditions and creeds the word of God or have no traditions, practices, or creeds which help us into the Word of God. Three things about this, and then a final point. First is, how is a church really to hold fast to apostolic traditions in a traditional way without simply becoming a stodgy, traditionalistic, we always do it this way kind of church? How are we to do that? Number one, remember, hold Christ. In all this talk of traditions, and even in the apostles saying, hold the traditions and so on, it is not to be forgotten that we have no relationship, no saving relationship with a doctrine or even with a truth as it is written and so on. We have relationship, there is salvation in none other but the person of the Son of God. That's why the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2, over against the errorists who had their traditions of men, said to them their problem they was they were not holding fast the head, Jesus Christ, Colossians 2 8. That's what we must do. You see, the Word of God itself. And then the creeds and practices of the church are only instruments to help you to know Jesus. And that must be our goal. In the means of grace, in the public preaching, and in the private meaning, uh, uh, means of grace, and the ecclesiastical traditions, there must be this attentiveness and focus on Jesus Christ, the person of the Son of God. And so that the people there become not just top-heavy, and uh, very learned and so on, or become ignorant on the other hand, but they know Jesus Christ. That's the vital point of this ministry here. Secondly, we must love the truth. If we want to know Jesus Christ, we will hold the traditions and stand fast by holding them, by loving it. Notice in verse 10, the problem with those who apostatize is that they receive not the love of the truth. Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 24 when he said at the end of time, many will perish because they receive not the love of the truth. Their love waxed cold. That's vital. You see, it's not what's in the back of some songbook. It's not even what's here or on your shelf and you blow off the dust once in a while and read it. Or even if you're voraciously devouring the Scripture, but it's where well, your love is at. Where's your love? Truth is vital. Truth and love together are living. That's the point here. Receive the love of Christ, which is the love of the truth. Love God. That's the commandment. That's the response to a people that's loved and then, and then finally, beloved, hold Christ, love the truth, and let's do this together. Not only with one another, but with the church of all ages. 
That's what being a traditionally biblical church is. Loves, holds, stands in the apostolic tradition by ourselves using the means of grace and recognizing ecclesiastical creeds and practices as important. We will be united in this. And that's the first benefit, united. Striking how everywhere in the Bible that there's people who bring lies, it's said that their problem is not the only that they bring lies, but they upset the flock. Paul says that to Timothy. Heed not foolish questions and genealogies apart from the word of God and so on, and bring your own philosophies, because they gender strifes. They cause bickering, and this and that and the other thing. They cause bickering. And when you're not holding fast Christ the head and holding the traditions, when you're trying to invent the wheel again and again and again, and you think that because you were born again on Sunday, the truth was born then too, when you do that, it's going to be you and me and the next guy, and we'll all have our different opinions, and we'll inevitably end up having three different churches where there's three different people, or no churches at all. But when... There is this receiving of truth from the apostles via Christ himself and his church in all the ages. There's this unity, not just with the next church down the road, but with the church 2,000 years ago. That's the unity. Now, that's wonderfully three-dimensional, isn't it? So, unity. Then there's liberty. Many people say, ah, oh, you traditional people, I can't handle that. I need contemporary worship. I need a church without these, this baggage of the creed. They say, oh, oh, oh let, let me free. Well, here's what the apostle says. Romans 6, 17, but God be thanked that you were the servants, the slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that tradition, same idea, which was delivered to you. You were the servants of sin. But in obeying the truth as it is in Jesus, receiving the tradition, in being a faithful recipient of the deposit of truth that the church has given, you now are free. You are free. Children, young people, when you join the church, confess your faith, you're free. It's the beginning of this life of public Christianity and freedom and taking the yoke of Christ upon you, which is easy, and his burden is light. Other benefits, we could say, are the generations come to know the truth. And the truth is traditional, and it's taught so. It's truth that you pass on. It's a baton that you pass on to the church of tomorrow. And you can see that. When your children confess their faith and they show godliness, they're taking the baton. They're saying, we're going to run too. We're going to be godly. We're going to stand up for the crown rights of Jesus in all of life. We're going to be pure. We're going to seek employment that helps us advance the cause of Christ and to be holy. We're going to be those people who use our talents and all of our gifts for the cause of Jesus Christ. That's wonderful truth of this. But then there's a great humility and a great godliness and thanks to God that is worked by the Spirit through a church that stands fast and holds the traditions. Because by this we know God holds us. You know, beloved, Church of Jesus Christ, God should have let us go a long time ago. He should have crowned our efforts with what they deserve. The just wrath of God. But God holds us. And that's the truth we have to remember here. The truth what comes out in the latter benediction that Paul gives to the Thessalonian believers. Brethren, hold fast, he says, but he knows it can be very, very discouraging. It's very discouraging for us, beloved, to be a traditional church. It can be, because nobody shows up. Well, it's not popular. The popular churches are the ones that are up to date, they say. They're the ones who have new things all the time, new bands, warm-up bands for the sermon. The popular churches are the ones who have the charismatic preachers who come with great eloquence, 
far more than I have. And they come, and they, they woo the people, and they have their Mars hills, which just like the Mars hill of old in Athens, they delight in some new thing. Traditional churches don't fare so well, at least from that point of view. They're not so popular. There's nothing hip about what we're doing here. But we pray there's everything holy about what we're doing here. And that's the point of worship. And that's the point of truth, to praise the holy God. And so the word of God comes to us. You hold fast. You hold fast, but you remember, God is holding you. You hold fast. You suffer. You cry about it. You are in angst about it. The elders are angst about it because it's not drawing the people that maybe they thought they would. But you hold fast and you do the next thing. And God will give people to your church that you need who stand on the apostolic traditions fast and love what God has deposited with the church in her creeds, in her practices, not infallible, and always discerning them with the word of God, but thankful. Church of Jesus Christ, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by apostolic word or epistle, or in the sermons and instruction that's in your homes and in this church in the light of that glorious word of God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless, we pray, the preaching of the gospel. However weak sermons are, mighty, almighty is your word. And we pray, Father, that we may all hear and be glad. You speak to us once again of this wonderful thing you've done to us. You've saved us and you've given us truth. You've revealed to us in your word how great you are in mercy in Jesus Christ. Help us to stand strong and our children, the next generation, to stand strong. Lead others to be with us who will stand strong and be biblically traditional. And so we have a living, living truth from now until the kingdom come in the generations, even in as many as God shall call. Amen. <clears throat> Let's sing now of the firm foundation, 400. 11, firm foundation we have, let's sing stanzas 1, 2, and 5, first two and the last of 411.
receive God's benediction. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.